basically in the ninth circle is figuring he's too hot a commodity. Uh, he's bringing too much attention on us. We got to get rid of him. Recent attempt by Bergoglio to rally his forces. He called all the bishops in the world to a special conclave in Rome and less than half of them responded, which is, it's unbelievable because that's never happened before. You can't become a, a priest or a bishop or a cardinal, let alone a pope, without endorsing and you know, implementing this policy of, of protecting child rapists, basically a huge criminal conspiracy. It's the same thing with something even more serious like the Ninth Circle, where you all know about it and no one is to talk about it or you're dead. It's that simple. Many religions are fear-based and they think, well, I'm going to go to hell if I even question these things. And that's what we've got to help break people from, you know. The scientists at Live Pet are hard at work solving our cancer epidemic. They have the most promising cancer trials going on now with pet clinics around the country that I have ever seen. You can see the promising cancer research and trials going on on some of the past shows that I've done. The links are below. While working with C60 and other ingredients, these talented scientists developed a hair growth serum that really works. They sat on it for years. After all, cancer is their focus. But they now realize how much the profits from this product could really help their cancer research. So the C360 hair growth product was launched. C360 hair growth is specifically designed to revive your hair growth by targeting hair follicles and restarting your hair growth cycle. C60, the active ingredient in C360 hair growth, reactivates hair follicles that have stalled due to hereditary hair loss, physical conditions, or environmental factors that may affect follicle production. You will begin to see visible results using C360 hair growth within three to six weeks. Buy today knowing that your future hair growth will help fund very promising cancer research. See more at the link below. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. I have Kevin Annette coming back because he's going to fill us in on the politics that are going on at the Vatican. Apparently, Pope Francis is experiencing a palace coup and we expect that he's going to be removed from office sometime the end of February. It will be more of a figurehead move, but you'll start to see major shifts in, in power, and he will talk about that, and eventually he'll be out from a public standpoint for reasons that they make up. So he's, he's gonna explain what's going on politically, how the Vatican is warring, and what's behind all that. And then he's talking about the church in general, the power, how the United States is, the churches in the US are, are reacting to all this and people taking their power back. And it's, a, it's actually a beautiful thing, a lot of the stuff that's going on in this realm. And I'm really happy that it came on to explain it to us. For those that are Catholic, I, I'm hoping that um, I don't want you to be offended by this interview. I'm really hoping that you see this as a labor of love that he has trying to help children and trying to help people of all faiths and that you know that I completely respect whatever faith that you have and Catholics too. I just don't condone the hurting of children and I, I think that is fundamentally flawed and that we need to fix it no matter what faith you are. I want to let everybody know that Kevin does stick around for my patrons and he tells a personal story of how his life journey has affected his children and how his relationship with his children are now. It's a beautiful story and I recommend you listening to that. That's for my patrons and I have the link below. So let's get into my interview now with Kevin Annette. Hi, Kevin. Thank you so much for rejoining the program. Thank you, Sarah. I, you know, you are the expert out there on what's really going on with the churches, the Vatican, the churches around the world and all their nefarious activities. And there is some huge things going down in the Vatican. They're saying that the Pope Francis is going to be removed from power. Can you tell me what the politics are going on right now in the Vatican and how it led up to that? Definitely. Uh, well, it's it's one of the oldest and, of course, most confusing institutions because uh, there's so many levels of power. Like churches generally are structured that way. 
there's no accountability. So it's very confusing from the outside to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, but in terms of the Vatican, there's two general factions, and they've been warring with each other ever since Bergoglio came in after Ratzinger. Uh, essentially, what's going on is there's the, the, the cult that people know as the Ninth Circle, a very old 400-year-old cult. It's gradually assumed leadership because it's a Jesuit creation from the 1500s. It's assumed leadership of, you know, of the Vatican through the, what's called the Curia, which is the College of Cardinals in Rome, traditionally run by the old Italian mob, right? The old Italian cardinals, more and more because the population of the Catholic world has shifted to the third world. Um, you know, a lot of them are in Africa and Asia now. The Catholic population is plummeting in North America and Europe. Um, you find there's a, a, a shift happening in the power to these third world cardinals. Now, at the end of the day, though, the... The Ninth Circle calls the shots, and Jorge Bagaglio, this Pope Francis, is so close to the Ninth Circle. He was a practicing member in Argentina uh, when he was a bishop. There were children being sacrificed, and for people who know, the Ninth Circle is a sac child sacrificial cult, a cannibalistic cult. It involves top card cardinals, and ever since the early 20th century, every serving pope is expected to be a member. Um, now, Bergoglio got in very quickly with the Ninth Circle. The problem is he was tied closely to what's now the royal family in the Netherlands. Uh, a woman called Maxime Zoriega, she's now the queen of the Netherlands. She's Argentine, like he is. And his uh, or her father was in the cabinet uh, during the military junta there in the early 80s, late 70s. Um, Jorge Mac uh, Zoriega was good friends with Jorge Bergoglio. And they were buddies in this Ninth Circle ritual. The military was using it like they would often grab children of political prisoners, the thousands of people in the prisons. Their children would be abducted, used in these, these Ninth Circle ceremonies and killed or, or trafficked for a lot of money. Catholic Church very implicated. That's how Bergoglio got so high up in the church, by working with that. Now, a lot of that is coming out now. And basically, the Ninth Circle is figuring He's too hot a commodity. Uh, he's bringing too much attention on us. We got to get rid of him. So uh, an example of that is the uh, recent attempt by Bergoglio to rally his forces. He called all the bishops in the world to a special conclave in Rome, and less than half of them responded, which is it's unbelievable because that's never happened before. And did they not respond because they think he's involved with, or they believe he's involved with this child sacrifice stuff, or is there other reasons as well? Well, essentially it's because it's not like they're morally objecting to the Ninth Circle because they all know Perfect. about it. Perfect. Uh, it's because, uh, you know, when one top guy in the mafia starts talking, everybody runs for cover and they, they dump the guy in the East River. Um, that's essentially what's going on. And uh, so they are. They know that this, the sh his ship is going down, and they're not associating with him for that reason. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the the cardinal that organized this conclave is now name. He's a Canadian, uh, Quebecois uh, from uh, Marc Oulet, His name is. He was one of the guys who was named at a Ninth Circle ritual in Montreal in December 2015, which we helped to break up. We had people there. We prevented it. And uh, Ouled is also connected to this West Coast thing called the 12 Mile Club, which is a similar child sacrificial cult in Vancouver involving lots of church, business, government people. Um, now, Ouled is the one who basically sabotaged the bishops from coming. So it's clear that, you know, as the, uh, the point man for the Ninth Circle in this, Ouled is helping bring, in, bring down his boss. So it shows you how fractured the whole situation is. The two warring factions are, is it one who is for this ritual involved in all that crap and others that aren't, or is it just two bad groups? They're both involved with Ninth Circle. There isn't any faction in the church that isn't. Uh, an example of that, by analogy, you know, the, the policy called Crim and Solicitanus, it's a... Uh, it's up on our website, um, murderbydecree.com. You can read it. It's been the standing policy in the Catholic Church when it involves child rape. And it says every priest, every Catholic in the world is expected to cover up child rape when it happens, not to tell the police. And if they talk, they're excommunicated. Well, um, you can't become a, a priest or a bishop or a cardinal, let alone a pope, without endorsing and you know, implementing this policy of, of protecting child rapists, basically a huge criminal conspiracy. 
it's the same thing with something even more serious like the ninth circle where you all know about it and no one is to talk about it or you're dead it's that simple so it's not like they're objecting morally to what's going on what they're doing is they're jockeying for power using uh the whole issue like it happens all the time in politics like uh, one politician will get his flunkies to accuse another politician of being a child rapist and that's why you have to check out your facts when you hear a rumor about a politician or anyone being involved in quote pedophilia uh, because you know it's often a political weapon so in this case it's being used that way in the church definitely well, what I understand about the Vatican is it has been purposely infiltrated so that all of the people in that are rising, or the majority of them, are pedophiles so that they can control them and they can have this. So the base of the church is still, can, can, could very well still be very clean and good, but the, as they, they identify them and those are the ones that end up moving up. Is that an accurate assessment? In one sense, it is that, yes, you can't be part of a, uh, an official child killing institution. And that's what it is when you look at the body count and, and its policies and practices. You can't be part of that and not be complicit in some way. Uh, you could say the people in the pews or the lower level priests are more ignorant about this stuff, but they choose to be ignorant. And don't forget that under the law, ignorance is no defense in a crime. You can say, oh, I didn't know the murder weapon was being hid in my house. I didn't know my relative was killing children. Uh, it doesn't matter, you're an accessory. And that's the, the condition of every Catholic in the world when they give money to that institution, uh, regardless of whether they knew or not. So legally, morally, that's really not the issue. In practically speaking, yes, there's openings at the bottom to appeal to people. And in fact, we've done that recently. We've issued a, a, a flyer that's it's just being distributed in nine countries. Uh, translated and everything, where it's calling on Catholics to uh, boycott, financially boycott their church. Fill out a form saying, as long as these policies are going on and practices, I'm not going to give money to this church. They put it in the collection plate. When we did that 10 years ago about genocide in Canada, you, we had an almost instant reaction. The government, the churches started squawking about apologies. They are afraid of two things and only two things, their public image and their money. With the world being so crazy, I have two great gift ideas to help you and your family stay safe. First, the Shockwave Torch. This tiny tool drops a 260 pound thug in two seconds. It packs so much power in such a small package, it's scary. Thank God it's got a safety on it. If you wanna stay safe in a dangerous world, I promise the Shockwave Torch will help. You can also get as an additional item this combo pack it's an ultra powerful police grade 18% pepper spray with an ultra discreet 3 million volt stun gun. I am getting these for every one of the women in my family. I believe we should all be carrying this for self-defense. And with gun laws becoming stricter than ever, what a great option for women in your family or even men in your family to be safe. With purchase of any other item, you can get this for only $29. So click the links below to find out more information. I, I could see that. Now, is there a way for these churches to break off and be independent from this? Because, you know, they really, a lot of people really believe in their faith and they believe in what, and, and it does, Jesus did not teach you, if you believe in that. Jesus does not teach rape kids, steal, traffic, you know, use the church for all sorts of nefarious money laundering and things. <laughs> I don't think yeah. he said that. So, well, yeah. Jesus had nothing to do with the Catholic Church, of course. It's like Jesus never talked about uh, popes, sacraments, priests. He didn't even talk about the Trinity. The word Trinity is nowhere in the Bible. Uh, so all of this is human creation. And yes, absolutely, people need to split off, but they need to do more than that. that. They also have to question their own beliefs. Uh, that, you know, when you talk about something like original sin, the idea that children are born evil and can only be cleansed through you know, the sacraments of this child killing institution. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you hold your own newborn child in your arms, right? And um, it, it, it's, it goes against common sense. It's like, it, it's like anything in the world. We have to follow our heart and our mind and our conscience. And when any institution or dogma gets in the way of that, we just step back from it. And it's, that's the hard part, part for people because they, it, it's, 
many religions are fear-based and they think, well, I'm going to go to hell if I even question these things. And that's what we've got to help break people from, you know. So now let's get back into how the Pope is going to be removed from power. What is, what's really going on there? In their situation, it'll be done discreetly. It won't be, uh, you know, they won't just toss him on, bring a new guy. He'll, he'll probably be kept in for a while as a figurehead, as a puppet. Um, and he'll and do that? He'll make a deal. I mean, it's like all these guys, they're worried about their, their skin. They'll work a, a deal. Like, uh, you know, when, like, for example, George Pell, a senior cardinal in Australia, he was brought to trial for covering up child rape, for enforcing the standing policy of the church. Uh, he, uh, they made a deal. He got off. He didn't do any jail time. That's what you do. It's, it's uh, you know, the pretense. And so they will, um, they need to create the appearance that everything is fine, that there's no crisis going on. Meanwhile, they'll bring somebody in from the wings. There'll be, uh, he'll probably step down this year sometime for health reasons. And uh, their chosen guy will be brought in the way Bergoglio was brought in, appointed to, bring, to replace Ratzinger. The likely candidate from what we hear is a, a Cardinal Arinze from Nigeria. Uh, politically, it's good to bring in a, the first black pope now. It'll make it seem like the church is going through another great progressive change. Um, but again, it's just more window dressing and the policies, the practices don't change, right? So won't people start questioning why all these popes are stepping down? Because it just doesn't happen. Even health reasons, they stay until they're just on their deathbed. Well, it's like Lee Harvey Oswald, right? I mean, everybody knows one guy couldn't have killed Kennedy, but that's still the official line. And uh, people believe it. It's like, you know, when it, they, they call it the elephant in the living room, everyone's pretending it's not there. Uh, human beings can coexist with all these contradictory realities around them and then tell themselves, no, everything's fine. Um, that dissociated doublethink is what allows these institutions to carry on. But at the same time, people are waking up and voting with their feet. And an example of this is I've done a lot of work in Dublin over the last year, uh, which we should talk about. It's a really encouraging development, uh, what people are doing there on the ground. But um, I went in uh, to a friend of mine took me into Pro Cathedral. It's the largest Catholic cathedral in Dublin. And this is the, the center what's traditionally, I mean, the quote, most loyal Catholic nation on earth, their biggest cathedral in Dublin seats over 500 people we counted 32 that sunday morning all old people well and and i think that's what you're seeing all over the country and the united states and like you're yeah. saying the west mount but are you seeing that in all the religions is it across the board or is it more catholic no. the mainstream religion, catholic church the church of england uh the the traditional denominations like that are plummeting their, their numbers are going down except in certain areas of the world uh, where they do a lot of missionary stuff and, you know, where we find that uh, the wealthier people get, the more affluent, the less they go to church. It tends to be poor people who go to church because they don't have anything. They're looking to salvation. They're looking to somebody else to do something for, for them. And they feel hopeless often and more prone to superstition and manipulation. And, and that's just, you know, historically the case. So you find those factors at work, but there's something even more fundamental going on. In America, for example, um, it, most of the bishops stayed away. The biggest boycott of Bergoglio happened among American bishops of any country. And the reason that is, is they have to follow their base. And they know that a lot of Americans, like 95% of American Catholics practice birth control, right? And uh, Americans, uh, yeah, they may be that religiously, even if they're that way. They're also raised with the idea that we're citizens of a republic, and there shouldn't be a, a there should be church state separation the, the catholic church should not be having all the benefits they have uh even american taxpayers money is being channeled to the vatican bank through these financial concordats without anyone's knowledge or consent i mean that riles an american who's used to thinking that you know we're, we're sovereign people and and we shouldn't have a religion dominating us that's what we ran away from europe for you know um well, exactly. And I would like to see these Catholic churches who are not participating and, and find and are horrified by this child, whatever they're doing with these children and break off and say, enough, you guys are, you guys should all go down. But this institution is, we're opposite of that. We're teaching love and yep. you guys are not. You see that all over. In fact, I'm in touch with with Christians all over who are doing exactly that. Uh, 
even Catholics, I've, I've known Catholic priests in Canada who split off. Uh, they get defrocked and their funds seized and buildings seized immediately. Uh, but who cares? That. Okay, so yeah, the, the criminals who are killing children are going to dump me. Oh, well, I already dumped right. you first, buddy. <laughs> you know, I mean, I look at you it. have to look at it like that. When I was defrocked by the United Church, that's exactly how I saw it. The natives said, hey, you must have done something right. You know, so. Um, exactly. Right. So that's that's good. Uh, Non-Catholic Christians, unfortunately, at their leadership level, a lot of them are tied in. As a matter of fact, the Vatican pays, financially subsidizes all the major denominations in the world through the World Council of Churches. Uh, Bergoglio was trying to get the churches to come back into the Catholic Church. It pretty much succeeded with the Anglican Church of England. Uh, no, he seduced a lot of these top church leaders with Vatican money, but at the lower level, people realize that, yeah, this has nothing to do with Christianity. It's the Roman Empire with a cross on it, and uh, we need to take back our faith. You know, and that, you hear more and more of that these days. Well, that's excellent. Now, people are concerned that we're moving to an atheist environment because that's just, that can be pretty dangerous too when you lose. Um, your spirituality. Now, whatever you believe in, you have to have some kind of spiritual base of how to be your spiritual being. So how do, and, and they're using it against people and they're saying Satanism is involved with that and there's a whole bunch of problems. What do you see there? Well, you're right, but you know, the, the, the reality is, let, since we're talking about, you know, the Church of Rome, it is an atheistic institution in the sense that they do not worship God and Christ, they worship a man. Um, and the proof of that is the name of the Pope, Vicari Christi means in Latin, the, re the one who replaces Christ. Um, uh, Pontifex Maximus, he carries the title of the Roman emperor, which means the great bridge between heaven and earth. All these quotes from popes saying, I am the way, I am Christ on earth. Time and again, they're saying that. So. It's not a Christian institution in that sense. They don't look to God. They look to their own sacraments, their wealth. I mean, the perfect example of that, you go into the Vatican Museum, there's a big board up, and it says papal blessings, 150 euros. You can buy your way into heaven. You, you pay enough money, and, and you literally, the Pope's prayers can get you your relatives out of hell. Like, in that sense, it's it's very atheistic, posing as, as a religious body. So, but in a broader sense, um, the whole culture fosters atheism in the sense that what are we told all the time to trust, you know, uh, our faith or other things, right? Uh, including people, authority figures, uh, people in public office, that, that force all the time is a, a true believer is really at war with the world. And that's what Christ says all the time in the gospels. If you, the world persecuted me, it'll persecute you. You know better. I think that that's the if you're striving to find how to be a loving, caring person who's doing what's right for the universe, you're running into this all the time, like exactly what you're saying. All the time. And, you know, I find that when I got thrown out of the United Church for just trying to be a Christian minister <laughs> with the wrong people, um, Indians and poor people, um, I found exactly that, that what they were objecting to was the fact that I was taking it seriously, what was in the Gospels. And you can't do, it's like, I guess in any job, if you're too good, all the mediocre persons running the place get threatened by you, right? I mean, we all experience that in one way or the other. You can't be too excellent. You can't let your, let your, light, yet let your light shine too much. And that's even more so the case. You, you know, see that everywhere. You, that's you, too yeah. bad, but yes. Yeah. yeah, it's true. And it's even more in the case in the Catholic Church, you're saying? Well, in any church, really, uh, people are there, essentially, 90% of them not out of faith, because it's always a seed, a remnant of people who really, I think, have that calling. It's there, it's a traditional pastime, it's a social club, it's a, a place for people to feel better about themselves, all sorts of things. And I'm not writing those things down, I'm just saying it really has little to do with your own faith calling, which can very much often lead you in conflict with the powers of the world and, and the situation in the world. And that's when our faith is tested, you know. That's exactly right. That's when our faith is tested. And I'm hoping that the United States bishops and the people here break away and say enough, because that would send a huge message. I see it happening. I think we're having another reformation like 500 years ago. And, 
and don't forget in the Reformation, Martin Luther tried originally just to reform the Vatican. He wasn't a revolutionary body stretch. Uh, guys later like Calvin and John Knox and others took the Reformation a lot further and finally broke from Rome. But it could start as the bishop saying, well, we just want our own autonomous national Catholic churches. But from that, people are not going to stop. They're going to keep carrying it saying, well, why do we need this dogma? Why can't congregations be self-governing? And don't forget, that's how America started with the Puritan tradition of self-governing congregations led to self-governing people in the political world, too. So it can be a very renewing process, you know, like as Abraham Lincoln said, a new birth of freedom. I think it's a great time to be living in. You know? Yeah, I, I agree. OK, so now if Pope Francis is removed from power, what kind of si signals will we see that shows that there's been a shift? Um, well, you'll like I say, the likely scenario is that there'll be uh, he'll be appearing less in public. Eventually, within probably the next few months, he'll announce health problems that need to retire. They'll float those articles in the media that he's been experiencing heart problems or whatever. Um, meanwhile, the profile of who they want in will be raised. And eventually, they'll just do that flip. Don't forget, Bergoglio was, Francis was appointed in less than 24 hours. It wasn't even a vote among the cardinals. It was the quickest appointment. It wasn't even an election. In, in papal history. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's the way it'll, it'll come about likely. If not, I mean, you never know though, because the situation is so unstable that I think anything might happen, frankly. Well, and do you think that the rise of the rejection of their eh, satanic cult that they have going on, do you think that will have an effect on, I mean, they can't put somebody in who's clean at this point. My understanding is that there has been some clean popes that have tried to solve it and have gotten killed. But at this point, they have such 100% control of the church. That's, uh, what's going to happen there? I mean, they can't, well, you know you know what I'm asking? Yeah, the, the, in terms of honest popes, um, it's kind of like talking like about good and bad Nazis. I mean, the, the only two I can think of is it was Pope Joan, who was a woman in the 10th century, who actually, her memory was wiped out of Vatican records, but she was an English bishop who got appointed, and she pre pretended to be a man. One day they discovered her, uh, she gave birth, they and they killed her and the child on the spot. There's even a monument in Rome to where they killed her. Um, and then there was um, John Paul I. <laughs> in 1978. He lasted a month in office. He was this fairly humble guy um, from, I think he was from Milan or Turin, somewhere in the north, which had more radical traditions in the church. And uh, when he got in, he within 30 days, he was dead because what he tried to do is he started an investigation to the Vatican Bank and the money laundering, the ties with the mafia. He ordered the Italian bishops to sell a lot of their jewelry. He abolished the papal procession where he's carried in on guys' backs. He said, you know, he went out and it, the funny thing is, as an anecdote, there's a good book about his murder called In God's Name by David Yallop. He's an investigative journalist. And it's brilliant because it shows uh, the cardinals were very upset because the first week uh, uh, the guy's in office, he, he goes around and he starts looking into all these rooms. There's like 1,800 rooms in the Vatican. And they're getting upset about what he might find. And he's talking to the Swiss guards about, you know, how they're doing and how their families are. He said, no pope has ever done that, right? You're not supposed to be human. You're supposed to be this, this icon, right? So uh, he died. He was found dead in his sleep. Never an autopsy done. Everybody who knew him was dead within a year. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's was, not funny. I'm not laughing because it's no, funny. No, but Keep the, going. the magistrates investigating it, the cars got blown up. Um, it was the, the Holy Alliance, which is the Vatican Espionage and Assassination Bureau, who did it. And they they admitted it later, you know. Do you remember the the, the guy Hank found hanging under London Bridge? He was a banker. But they cleaned shop. They just closed down everything that he was uncovering. Then they bring in the guy from Poland, uh, John Paul II, who uh, immediately, you know, puts the mafia back in charge of the Vatican. He gets named a saint, of course. You know, it just goes on and on like that. So you can't last if you're honest in these institutions, right? So what do you think is the, the next step here? What do, we, what do we do? Because I think people are waking up and they're realizing that the Catholic Church has some major issues. What, what does the average person do? Pull out. Uh, pull back your energy, your thoughts, your money, your attendance. 
uh, there's nothing that goes on in a Catholic church that in, in terms of people's faith that can't be done in your own living room. That can't be done the way the Christian church started as small groups. You know, when Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, there I am. I think the meaning of that is pretty clear that you don't need a big church to have that presence. And in fact, uh, the Mennonites who I grew up with in Manitoba, they had the saying, God gets lost in a crowd. And I think it's true. You know, that this is meant to be shared. Uh, we're meant to help transform ourselves according to that love one on one in small groups. And so it's a matter of seeding that and not worrying about there being, I mean, anything to me, anything bigger than a congregation is a political system. It's, it's uh, you know, national churches. All of that is tied to empire. We know how it caused genocide. You know, I spent a lot of years documenting that. It's because that kind of worldly power is not supposed to be part of the Christian calling. And, uh, you know, I think it's a matter of returning to our roots, in other words, right? What do you think of Christian people who are just so judgmental? Like anything they do is judgmental. And if you, you, the Bible doesn't say that, and they look at one little verse, and there's a bunch of other verses that contradict it, but this is the verse they care about. Because they're the ones that are going to have a hard time with all this stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's kind of like, I find in every tradition, we, we tend to uh, divide things like this vertically, like there's Catholics, there's Protestants, there's Muslims. I do it the other way. I drew a line like this horizontally so that in every tradition, there's there's kind of a authority, a totalitarian tradition that says, you got to believe this or you're dead. And then there's that spiritual tradition from below that says, we all have a commonality here. We're the God of one people and God manifested differently. Okay. In Christ, some think in Buddha, uh, whatever, but the point is, it's it's uh, what the Quakers call that small, still light of God within each of us, right? And uh, that's what we built from. So if we could find a new common ground between crossing div all these political and religious divisions, um, I think especially these days, like in America, that's needed because people are so fractured politically, you know, and so fractured on these ground. And it's designed to have a few people keep us divided and conquer so they can steal our pockets. Quite often, that's the reason. Um, and, and that's how people are ruled, by fighting each other. So I, I think it's it's part of that recovery of, our, of ourselves that that's we need, right? And that's very different than one world religion. You're not saying that. You're saying a common thread. Because yeah. people are talking about this one world religion and all this stuff. If anything, you're saying the opposite of that. You're opposite. saying individual religion with inside yourself. Try to understand we're all going to be connected with the basic elements of light and the universe and beauty and love and what Jesus was trying to teach us. Yeah, like, you know, e pluribus unum means from many one. Like everybody gets and forms this corporation. It's the other way around. From one source of God, there's many. There's infinite diversity, like in nature, right? There's a source of life, but then it manifests in all these ways. And Bergoglio advocated the one world church. I mean, he said that at the United Nations when he came to the States in 2015. The one world church is the, is the counterpart of the one world corporation that we're heading towards. You know, eventually there's going to be one single corporation everybody works for. You know, we're, we're evolving that way very quickly and um, devolving rather. And um, religion is always a way to keep people captive up here so that a king can rule them. I mean, that's essentially what state religions have been for. So we have to break that whole thing and go back, reclaim. And that's a lot of the emphasis of what I do now in my work is training people in the common law, establish local public assemblies. There's there's great. I'm actually going to Seattle. There's a people's assembly that's formed in Seattle where um, they convene every week and they it's a neighborhood assembly. They say, what laws do we want in our neighborhood? How can we bring this about? How can we police our neighborhoods ourselves? We're telling the government and the cops and, and everyone to go away. We're taking back power, right? And if we can do that all over the place, whether it's in our religious systems, whether it's in politics, whatever, I mean, that's our hope. That's the only way we can get out of this mess, I think. One of well, the ways. And that's a, a lot like what the Yellow Vests are trying to do in France. And mm -hmm. Now, with this one corporation, is there a single family that owns it or is it shareholders across many powerful people? It's It's... It's shrinking all the time. The reality about investigating these things is that you never really see who's in charge. You see their puppets, you see the people close to them, but they're not going to reveal who they are. So for anyone to say it's this person, it's Rockefeller, it's, 
Yeah, they're they're involved, but um, again, this is a question of faith. I don't believe the ruler of this world is visible. I believe it's a people call it Satan. They call it, it's a force of destruction. Um, it's interesting that Jesus, in when he's tempted in the wilderness, Satan comes to him and says, "All of the powers and kingdoms of the world have been given to me," right? Um, and so I think that ultimately we're dealing with a spiritual battle, a spiritual question of what force controls people uh, who are in those positions of, of power in the world. And I, I know from dealing with them, or at least some of their lower level people, these people don't have, don't seem to have a conscience anymore. It's being, you know, eliminated somehow, or they've willingly eliminated in themselves. But that's why it's impossible. And there's no point to appealing on a moral basis to people in power. Uh, you have to threaten them. You have to threaten their money and their their image. Uh, but but isn't that why uh, human compromise has turned into the only currency of the powerful at this point? I mean, that's it, it's all about human compromise, and they use children to do it. Right. Yeah. And I and what this whole thing has revealed about child trafficking and, and killing and all that is that it's traditionally been one of the ways that everyone's kept in line because. If you're traumatized at a young age as a child, you don't know how to resist anything. You just go along with the flock, right? You're afraid all the time. That's how any elite wants its people. Um, so child abuse is part of the system. It's not a it's not a uh, uh, <laughs> a rare thing. It's not the exception. It's the rule. It's just hidden a lot because we don't want to look at it. People look away. You know, two issues people shy away from. I find all the time is child abuse and criticizing churches. It just say, oh, we're not allowed to do that, right? And that's their protection. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if if bad things are going on, we have to shine light on it. End mm -hmm. of story. And it, it, no matter what, that's what the, the deal is. And, and you can't point to your Bible and say, we're not supposed to question this. No, right. we're supposed to question anything that where there's this evil going on. That's yes. what we're about. Now, uh, you have a book coming out. Can you talk about that? Uh, well, I've got one that just came out. Uh, it's called... Oh, it just came out. Okay, yeah. It's called At the Mouth of a Cannon. It's about uh, genocide and on the west coast of Canada, but how it came about, what I call the three-headed octopus, uh, big money, church, and government. Uh, and I document really the issue that got me fired when I exposed how the logging companies, the churches... The, the government were all working together to displace the natives, to wipe out their children, to grab their land. And um, it, it's really along the same theme of my other work, but it's more specific. And what it does is it names names. You know, the old saying, evil has an address. It isn't just some abstract thing. There are names and addresses of people doing these things. So I name them in that book. Um, you and, name them and you give people specifics so they have more of a concrete idea of what's really going on. Exactly. And, and, you know, people often say, well, you can't name them, can you? They're going to sue you. And I say, well, in 25 years, no one's ever sued me. What, what does that tell you? It means that if they were right. It means you have leverage. Well, it also means that I'm right, because if I was wrong, yeah. they would have all sorts of evidence they present against me in court immediately to prove that I'm lying. Well, the leverage you have is that, yeah, is they don't want to go to court because now all this is going to be revealed publicly. It's the same with Jimmy Boots, because how come he's still alive? It's because he right. has so much leverage, because he has so much information on people. Well, don't forget, I mean, even if you're a very prominent person who millions of people know and love, they still whack you. As a matter of fact, it, the more you're well-known, the likelihood of being whacked increases, because then you're a... When they killed Martin Luther King, it was done in plain sight to get everybody afraid, which it did. And um, when they... The same thing happened in my congregation. They They... I was the first minister in church history, in my church history, to be publicly defrocked. That's because it was a show trial. They wanted to make an example of me. And sure enough, everyone clammed up for years. It took a lot of work to finally bring this stuff out. So, um, Well, then how do you it, keep yourself safe? I don't worry about being safe because... Um, Does God protect you because you're, you're doing the right thing? Because I, and with what, I, what I'm doing, and yeah. I don't, I don't want, I want you to answer this. Yeah. What yeah. I'm doing, I just say I have to do this, and yeah. I, I feel protected because the universe is calling me to do what I'm that's doing. That's right, Sarah. And when because you're operating out of a positive energy that says, I'm my concern isn't what might happen to me. My concern is what's going to happen to them if I don't. 
those children, whoever, right? And that energy of offense rather than defense, uh, in the art of war, Sun Tzu said in his book, Sun Tzu says, when you are on the offensive, it doesn't matter how small you are, the enemy has to react. If you're on the defensive, no matter how big you are, you've lost the initiative and, and they can attack you. So being out there all the time and not worrying about yourself, it's what brings a lot of protection. And um, I wouldn't know the mind of God, really, to say, but I think uh, definitely that people like me who do this and you, we do have that protection. And I don't know if there's an explanation entirely. Um, I have no problem with mystery and ambiguity. I think it's good. The important thing is we do what's right. And, and you know, that's what counts. You just right? do what's right. And then you can't, you can't shy away because <laughs> you're scared. You gotta do what's right. And I realize you have to be smart. You're not gonna walk into a building that has bombs in it or something, but you're, sure. you're gonna do what, you have to do what's right because otherwise, what's the point, you know? Right, and, and of course, by doing that, we set ourselves apart and people come to, it's kind of a codependency. People come to depend on that. They say, oh, Sarah's doing it. I don't have to. Kevin's done this, led this campaign. Uh, yeah. it back. No. Right. And, and that's often the attitude. And we have to, and I say to people all the time, I'm not an organizer. When I come into your community and hold a workshop, I'm not here to organize you. I'm a catalyst. It's up to you to organize yourself. You have your own answers. Perfect. And that's, that you works. have to, you have to, people, I'm really hoping people, because I'm too, I can't organize everything that I'm bringing on either, and you, you obviously, you don't, you don't have, you're going everywhere. What we're, what you're trying to do is bring more people in to join you in this cause. It's yeah. only going to really work when we have this enormous mass of people saying enough. It, it, it's really, going to come yeah. from all of us. Absolutely. And uh, in reality, you don't need a, a majority. Uh, you need a critical mass of maybe five to ten percent. That's sure. how things can be moved. Uh, and we that's the tipping point. Canada. Yeah, yeah, and even less than that. We we only had two dozen people in our campaign in Canada, and look, we forced all this stuff out in the open because we hit strategically where they weren't expecting. And uh, I never expected this work would force a pope to resign, but. You know, when you've got truth on your side, you have a power way beyond your numbers. And that's the, the reality, right? Well, and the, and the people who are also in this truth and, and feel that, they have to join. They, I, I really still believe, like you saying, a catalyst, the more numbers that we can get who have that feel that need. And I'm hoping everyone who can do it does it. Because, again, that 5% is still a lot of people. It is, yeah. And, you know, there will always be a repercussion. Like I yeah. should mention to folks that uh, our tribunal website has been down. It's probably being wiped out for good, itccs.org. Uh, Murderbydecree.com is the site to go to. And uh, we found that all over. Communications, PayPal systems are all being disrupted these days more and more. So we say to people, don't rely on the Internet. Get out there. Take the knowledge. Work locally with people face to face. That's really our strength, you know. And do it, if we're doing it with truth and love and the right reasons, yeah. it, it wins in the long run. It has to. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't, if I end up dying because that is a wrong, I, that, this is why you go forward. You have to do it for the right reasons. Right. Some of us are set aside to do that. Let's not forget that some of us are different. You know, our character, you can see character differences all the time in these movements. A lot of people just feel they don't have the stamina and they drop away. Others don't drop away under the same pressure. Why is that? I mean, it's we're different, each one of them. Don't you think you can lean on others that have that stamina, but you can get involved where you can? You can. Where you can get involved. You can. Uh, people are at different places and understanding, and we all have the important, you know, we all have different things we can do, but the point is to do it together and to be consistent. Because if you do something once or 10 times, it fades. But if you do something over and over and over and over and make it your life focus, you have an enormous power and you start gathering others and more power around you. Persistence is the vital element and, and courage, you know. So where can they learn more about you? You just said your website. Is there anything else they can do? And repeat right, your right. website again. Oh, murderbydecree.com. Uh, I also have a Patreon site now uh, for people to get our films, books, to be su sustainers of this work. Uh, Patreon dot com then slash Kevin Daniel Annett 
but write to me the common land at gmail.com and I do a lot of work in the states uh, the, you know the the sovereignty consciousness is a lot greater there than in Canada the sense that people say wait a minute I'm the government <laughs> I am we are the government <laughs> I love that yeah. I mean we just have to take it back because obviously there's been some issues with that but we got to take that back yeah. well thank you so much for everything you do and will you stick around a little bit for my patrons yes and i should also mention uh, i've got 13 books now out i've written in the last four years and it covers all this stuff these different manuals for common law training whistleblowers manual all these books i mentioned they're all on amazon.com just put in kevin annett a-n-n-e-t-t -T, and you'll see them all Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah.